president. The assistant majority leader yes, recognizes. The quorum call be suspended. Without objection. Mr. President, what is a pending order of business? The Senate is in divided time till 7 p.m. Is it morning business or are we on an issue? We're on the motion to proceed. Thank you. Mr. President, we voted at noon today on whether we were going to start the debate on the student loan interest bill. For those who are following it, the largest federal loan to college students, the Stafford Loan, has a current interest rate of 3.4 percent. That interest rate expires on July 1st and doubles to 6.8 percent, meaning any students taking out a loan after that date will pay twice as much in interest. The practical impact of that is uh, fairly clear. If you were to borrow $20,000 to go to college through the federal Stafford loan and paid 3.4 percent on that $20,000, you would find that you were paying $4,000 less than you'd pay if you were at 6.8%. So it adds roughly 20% to the cost of that student's loan over the life of repayment. That is a significant expense. Most of us are aware, or should be, that students across America are going more deeply and deeply into debt to go to college. Average college indebtedness, $24,000. But an average doesn't tell the story. Because if you have one hand over a flame and one hand in a free freezer, on average, you've got to feel just fine. But in this case, students are going much more deeply into debt than $24,000. And the interest rate on the loan is significant. So it would seem that this is a pushover. Who disagrees with this idea? that lessening the burden on students in college is good for our country, because more students will seek higher education, good for the student, less of a burden when they graduate, good for their families, because many of them co-sign on these loans. In fact, this is one of those rare issues where both President Obama and Governor Romney agree. Don't let the interest rate go up from 3.4 to 6.8. So today, we called a motion to proceed, which literally means that we would begin debate on the student loan interest rate bill to keep it at 3.4 percent and not let it double July 1st. We heard from both sides of the aisle that everyone agreed that we had to do this. It sounded pretty easy. Then the vote was called. And at the end of the vote, not one single Republican senator would vote to proceed to the debate on the bill. Not one. One senator, Senator Snow, voted present. Every other Republican senator voted no. Those who were present voted no. How did this become a partisan issue? We have President Obama and Governor Romney agreeing, most Americans agreeing, we don't want the cost of student loans to go up, and it falls flat on its face at the floor at noon today. Not a single Republican would vote for it. I don't understand it. They say, well, we don't like the way you pay for it. It costs $6 billion to lower this interest rate that we would otherwise collect. Well, we pay for it by changing the tax code and closing a tax loophole used by accountants and attorneys under subchapter S corporations to avoid paying their regular income tax on their income. They go through this S corporation, call income dividends, and don't pay the regular income tax rate and don't pay the withholding tax that ordinary income is subjected to. I think closing that loophole is reasonable. It produces $6 billion. It pays for the student loan interest rate to stay down. I can accept that. Some on the Republican side of the aisle say, no, that is a tax increase. And they, many of them, have categorically said we will never, ever, ever, never vote for a tax increase, no matter what it is. And so they walked away from the student loan bill. They say we have a better way to do it. Senator Reid came to the floor, the Democratic majority leader, and said, fine. Then what we'll do is call the bill, and you offer your way to do it. Pay for it a different way. Bring it up for a debate. Let both sides debate it. Then let's vote on it. And then let's move forward. No, they wouldn't accept it. They all voted against proceeding to the bill. 
For anyone who is following what's going on here, this is what's known as a filibuster. The Senate is infamous for filibusters now. We filibuster everything. Even bills that are bipartisan, everybody agrees on, uh-uh. We're going to drag this out for hour after weary hour, eating up the time of the Senate, people watching C-SPAN, calling cable channels, asking for a refund because nothing's happening on the C-SPAN channel. It's because they're watching a filibuster on the floor of the Senate, and not much happens. Members like me will come from time to time, give a little speech, try to explain what's going on, but nothing substantive is going on. We're not considering the bill. And sadly, what we're doing, or failing to do, is going to affect a lot of innocent people. 7.4 million students will be affected if we don't change this interest rate. 7.4 million students across America. 365,000 in my state of Illinois. These Stafford loans, federal government loans, are mainly directed towards families in lower income situations so that students can borrow money to get through school. Uh, let me confess my conflict here. I wouldn't be standing here today without government loans. I borrowed money from the federal government to go to college and law school, National Defense Education Act, and paid it back. Uh, otherwise, I couldn't have gone to school, period. Just didn't have the money to do it. That's a story for most students. So these loans are needed across the board. We all know it from our personal experience. In 2007 to 2008, 30% of all undergraduates took out federally subsidized Stafford loans. That's about one out of three. They averaged about $3,400 a loan back four or five years ago. This year, the number's up to 8 million students. As I mentioned, 365,000 plus borrowers in my state. And as I mentioned, failure to reduce that interest rate will add to the cost of the loan that they have to pay back. If Congress doesn't act, these borrowers, 7.4 million students, including 1.5 million African-American borrowers, and over 986,000 Hispanic borrowers, will face this new penalty, this new loan increase. So it's clear to me that we should be spending our time here dealing with this. And I learned it firsthand when I went home last week. I started visiting campuses. In Chicago, I went to DePaul University. Downstate, I went to Bradley University in Peoria. In Decatur, I went to Millican University. And at each of these places, students came forward to explain what they were facing in terms of student loans. And I think I'd like to enter in the record here what experience they had that they shared with me. One of them uh, that I met was Amy. Amy goes to DePaul University in Chicago. She's an art major. Her sister Michelle came to join us at the press conference. Here's Amy's situation. Amy comes from a working family who can't help her pay. So she works and borrows to try to get through school. Amy is an art major. Her student loan indebtedness at the end of June will be, for four years, $80,000. That's how much she owes. But she says that bachelor's in art's not good enough. I think I need a master's. And I think it'll be another $60,000 I need to borrow. Whoa, $140,000, young lady, and you are 25 or 26 years old? You're borrowing not only the government loan, but way beyond it, into private loans. The government loans, 3.4%. The private loans for students in school range from 8 to 18%. They're much like credit card debt. They're so expensive. This young lady thinks she's doing the right thing. She was told, go to school, get an education. Follow your dream. Her dream is at the end of a very long and expensive road, $140,000 in debt. Her sister Michelle, a year at DePaul, decided she wanted to be a teacher and teach grade school. She looked at the indebtedness that she'd have to incur to finish school and decided to move back home to Indiana and to go to the local public college and try to get as many credits as she could at a low price and then perhaps finish at DePaul when it's all over. She thought, if my debt is too much, I won't be able to teach. I can't make enough money. I wouldn't be able to pay my loan back. That is one real-life story of two sisters who are doing the right thing and are facing student loan debt. How could we explain that we're going to raise the interest rate on either one of them at this point in paying back their student loans? It will make it virtually impossible for Amy, who could be 80000 to 140000 in debt, and for Michelle, 
How is she going to be the teacher which we want her to be? Bradley University in Peoria. I met a student named Rose. She told me that if the interest rate on her loans doubled, which will happen if the filibuster continues by the Republicans, she might have to move in with her parents after graduation and make other sacrifices to make her loan payments. Rose estimated that increasing interest rates will cost her about $4,000 because she plans on graduating with about $20,000 in debt. I also met Deshaun from Alton, Illinois. He's a freshman majoring in economics and political science at Bradley, and he wants to be an international lawyer someday. He's a first-generation college student, and he realizes without student loans, he doesn't have a chance to realize his dream. So what is the difference of opinion here about how to pay for these, these decreases in the interest rate from 6.8 to 3.4? Well, as I mentioned, we would close a tax loophole on subchapter S corporations used primarily by accountants and attorneys to avoid paying their ordinary income tax and the withholding that goes with it. There's another proposal coming out of the House of Representatives, which I think is really bad. They say that we should pay for keeping student loans affordable by reducing preventive health care programs. We have a fund that we've created that pays for, among other things, preventive care, childhood immunizations. So if the money is taken out of that fund, fewer American children will be receiving the vaccines and the inoculations, which we want for all of our kids to keep them safe. Is it important that kids receive these vaccinations? I think it's very important. Senator Reid said at a press conference here, that the incidence of the return of whooping cough, most people thought that was long gone, in the United States is at the highest level in 50 years, and the incidence of the return of measles in this country is the highest level in 15 years. Childhood immunizations are important to keep our kids healthy and safe. There's also money in this prevention fund, which the House Republicans want to cut out, calling it a slush fund, to be used for diabetes prevention. Mr. President, you can't pick up a newspaper or a magazine without reading about the incidence of obesity, the growing number of overweight children, and the increasing incidence of diabetes among our children. In fact, forms of diabetes that used to be confined to adults in America are now being found in children in America. And these children have to be treated with pretty powerful drugs to overcome this a disease of diabetes. So the House Republicans say, let us reduce the amount of money we are using for public education and treatment to reduce the incidence of diabetes and instead spend it on student loans. What a Faustian bargain that is. What a bargain with the devil that is. That we are going to put at risk children when it comes to immunizations and diabetes in order to help grown children, young adults, pay their student loans. Is that what it's come to? That we are so determined to not touch the tax code and the loopholes in it that we're going to risk the health of our children or the cost of college education for our kids as well? I think the approach in the House is not defensible. And I hope that at the end of the day, we can make sure that we do this in a responsible way. Mr. President, I wanted to mention one of the two other things very quickly. One of the real problems with debt in this country relates to for-profit schools. Go to Yahoo, go to Google, put in college or university and step back because what is about to hit you is an avalanche of ads for for-profit schools. Oh, I, I don't need to recount the names on the floor. Everybody knows them. These are the schools that are advertising constantly, come to our school. They run the ads on television. You might have seen one, the one that I think tells the story. It shows a young lady, lovely young lady, who is in a robe and pajamas, and she has her laptop on her bed, and she says, you know, you can go to college in your pajamas now. I'm going to XYZ for-profit school getting my college degree. So here's what's happening. These schools, these for-profit schools, are inundating the Internet and recruiting young people who otherwise might not go to college, many of them, 
And 10%, remember these three numbers, 10% of kids graduating from high school in the United States end up in these for-profit schools. So what for-profit schools are looking for are young people who are in lower income family categories because they qualify for the most federal assistance. Pell Grants, federal student loans. 10% of the students at the for-profit schools and 25% of all federal aid to education goes to these schools. More than two and a half times based on the number of students, what the amount you might imagine. But hang on, it gets more challenging. Almost half of the student loan defaults in America come from for-profit schools. Why? The kids get too deeply in debt, they end up dropping out because the debt is overwhelming, or they finish and get a worthless diploma and can't find a job. That is the story. So the student debt in traditional schools, public universities, private, not-for-profit universities, is one thing. On the for-profit side of things, that debt is just mounting particularly through private student loans. And here's the kicker, and you know this, Mr. President, because you've studied this issue too. Student loans are the only private loans in America, the only ones not dischargeable in bankruptcy. What it means is you're carrying it for a lifetime. You'll carry it till you pay it. That young lady, $140,000 in debt, couldn't have a clue what she's just done to the rest of her life by getting that deeply in debt. I have students contacting me over $100,000 in debt for a four-year education, and they find out the diploma's worthless. There's one school, Westwood College, Westwood College, that operates out of Denver, Colorado, and has a campus in Chicago. They're under investigation now by our state attorney general. These young people have been watching too many crime shows Westwood College knows it. They call them and say, how would you like a bachelor's degree in law enforcement? Oh, well, maybe, you know. I'm watching Hawaii Five-0 and CIS and all the rest. Maybe this is, I like that stuff. Good, come on out. Let me tell you the story of one of those students. She went to Westwood College. It took her five years to get her bachelor's degree in law enforcement. And she took that diploma to the police departments and the sheriff's departments all around the Cook County area, and they said, that's not a real college. That, we don't recognize that as a real diploma. You don't have a bachelor's degree. Well, there she was, a worthless diploma, and $80,000 in student loan debt for a worthless diploma. What's she doing now? She's living in her parents' basement. She can't borrow another nickel to go to a real college, and she owes, obviously, 80000 struggling with two jobs to try to pay it off. But then there's another part of the story we shouldn't ignore. Many of these schools, particularly the for-profit schools, realize that just hooking the kids into this loan is not enough. So they have the parents co-sign, and sometimes the grandparents co-sign. Six weeks ago, the New York Times ran a story of a woman who had her Social Security check garnished because she owed on a student loan. It wasn't her loan was her granddaughter's loan. She co-signed it, her granddaughter defaulted. Now the grandmother has her Social Security check being docked because she owes on the loan. This is a horrible situation. It'll be worse situation if the interest rate on July 1st doubles. This Republican filibuster against bringing down the interest rate on student loans, we now have an empty floor. Whoever thought it was a good idea for us not to debate and not to vote on this interest rate increase is long gone. They're not even here. That, I think, is real unfairness of a filibuster. If you can stop the business of the Senate and say you can't even take up the bill or consider the amendment, then I think you owe it to the Senate to be here and explain your point of view. I hope tomorrow, when the dawn breaks and a new day in the Senate opens, that some Republicans will come to the floor and explain this filibuster on college student loans. It's unfair to the students, to the families, to our country. People definitely need a college education. Many of them do in order to succeed in life. Some need training. Even those who need skilled training may end up at a community college or a course that requires a loan to get through. I hope that the Republicans who started this filibuster, who said we cannot even take up, consider, or debate the student loan interest rate issue, will be here tomorrow to explain why explain why they think this is not worth the time of the Senate to debate. 
Instead, we will just languish in this filibuster. Mr. President, I ask that the statement I'm about to make be placed in a separate place in the congressional record. Without objection. Mr. President, it was 11 years ago when I introduced a bill called the DREAM Act. Uh, just this last week, I was back in Chicago to um, attend a fundraising dinner for a group that I really respect. It's called the Merit Music Program. A lady about 20 years ago, when she uh, passed away, left a legacy to the Merit Music Program. And the legacy said, the money I'm leaving and any money you raise, I hope you will use to go into the public schools of the city of Chicago and to offer to young people a free musical instrument and music lessons if they are interested. This program has been an amazing success. It turns out that it's created an avenue and opportunity that many young people never dreamed of. And some of them have talents that are incredible. I was there at their dinner last last week and the violinists came in. Kids from all over the public schools of Chicago and they did a magnificent job. They feel so good about themselves, they develop a talent, they have a 100 percent college placement rate from the Merit Music Program. There's a linkage there. You know this, uh, Mr. President, as an educator from the state of Colorado, Den city of Denver. Many of these kids for the first time realized I'm worth something. I can do something and I can do it well. And it's that confidence and pride that not only takes them through the experience of playing music, but the experience of life and the experience of the classroom. It makes a big difference in their lives. So 11 years ago, I got a call from the director of the program, Duffy Adelson. Duffy was there last week. Duffy's a wonderful woman who's committed her, si her life to the Merit Music Program. She said, I've got an issue. One of the students at the Merit Music Program is an amazing young girl who plays concert piano. She's been accepted at major music schools, including the Manhattan Conservatory of Music in New York. She is Korean, and her mother, when she was filling out the application for the Manhattan Music School, came to the box that said citizenship, nationality. The girl turned to her mother, the girl's name was Teresa Lee, turned to her mother and said, uh, USA, right? And her mom said, no. You see, I brought you here when you were two years old and on a visitor's visa, and I never filed any papers. Now, your dad's a citizen. I'm a citizen. Your brother and sister who were born here are citizens, and we don't know what your status is. And her daughter said, what are we going to do? And she said, we'll call Durbin. Well, first they called Merit Music. Merit Music called me, and we checked the law, our staff did, and found out the law was clear. This young girl who had spent her 16 years living in the United States had to leave the United States for 10 years and apply to come back. 10 years. That's the law. And I thought to myself, that isn't fair. Mom didn't file the papers. Mom did something wrong. Why wouldn't we let this young woman do something right? So I put in the DREAM Act. I said, if you graduate high school and you have no serious problems when it comes to convictions or moral issues and you either complete service in the military or two years in college, we will put you on a path, a long path, toward becoming legal and becoming a citizen. That's the DREAM Act. So the DREAM Act has been here for 11 years. I've tried to pass it on the floor repeatedly. I can get 50 plus votes. I have last time I called it. But the Senate has this magic number of 60, super majority. It's even passed the House of Representatives. I've never been able to put 60 votes together here. And over the years, the support from the other side of the aisle has been decreasing. As it decreases, it gets more difficult. Over the years as well, a lot of people have stepped up and spoken up on behalf of this DREAM Act. Colin Powell said we'd love to have these young people in our military. Secretaries of Defense, like Secretary Gates, have said the same thing. President Obama was co-sponsor of the bill. These are young, talented people who can make a difference. Before I tell you the story of one of them here, I want to tell you the end of the story about Teresa Lee. She went to Manhattan School of Music. She majored in concert piano. She met a young man and married him. He was an American citizen that made her legal in America. And she played in Carnegie Hall. How about that? Eleven years ago, our government, the law said, leave the country for ten years. Instead, she came 
to Manhattan School of Music, made it through, and has made a success for life. There were a couple people who stepped up and made sure that that success was a reality in Chicago, and they were at the Merit Music Program. They had literally underwritten her college education because she couldn't qualify for any help. No federal loans, no federal grants, nothing, because she wasn't a citizen of the United States. It's an indication of a talent that would have been lost or wasted if, we didn't, if she didn't have good circumstances and we don't have the dream of for others who face the same thing. Let me tell you the story about Ided Reyes. This is a photo of Ided Reyes. She's a runner. I learned about her uh, on an article on ESPN.com. Ided was brought to the United States from Mexico when she was two years old. She grew up in San Diego, California. In high school, she was an honor student who played three sports, an active volunteer in her community. Among other activities, Ided volunteered at the Children's Hospital in Sherman Heights Community Center, where she tutored students and worked with the elderly. Ided was a member of the National Honor Society, and she graduated from high school with a 3.98 grade point average. The senator wishes he could have had an average like that. Ided was accepted into the University of California at San Diego, but she was unable to attend for financial reasons. Because she is not legal in the United States, she's ineligible for federal student loans or any other federal aid. Instead, she attends Southwestern Community College, where she has flourished as a student athlete. She maintains a 3.5 grain point average, and her dream is to become a doctor, an obstetrician. IDED has become the top-ranked women's junior college cross-country runner in the state of California. Among other awards, she's been given Athlete of the Year at Southwestern College and Pacific Coast Athletic Conference Track and Field Athlete of the Year. IDED has been offered athletic scholarships by more than a dozen top four-year colleges. But you can't because IDED is subject to deportation. She's not here legally. Another one, students that I've spoken to, have similar challenges, and their dreams can't be fulfilled unless we give them a chance. Just recently heard about a student who didn't know which way to turn, didn't know if the DREAM Act would ever pass, and applied for a visa to take his college education and go to work in Canada. The Canadians welcomed him. We need talent like that in Canada, they said. So they took him, and we deported him. Are we a better nation for that? Who got the best of that bargain? A person who was educated in the United States, succeeded in the United States, dreamed of being an American citizen, is now living in Canada. That, to me, is not the kind of thing that we need to see in our country. As I said, just because the parents made the mistake, got something wrong, these young people should be given a chance to do something right. I'm going to continue to work on passing the DREAM Act. And I would hope that I can appeal across the aisle to Republicans as well. Why is this a partisan issue? Don't we all believe that you shouldn't punish a young person for the crimes or sins of their adult parent? That's what's at work here. It's a basic question of justice. These young people, like I did, grew up in this America, pledging allegiance to the flag, believing this was their home. All they want is a chance to make their home the home of their dreams, a better place. I hope my colleagues will take the time to meet some of the dreamers. That's what they call themselves now. They have websites. They've stepped out into the light of day to introduce themselves to America. It's our only hope for passing. When people come to meet these young people and realize what amazing people they are, I think they'll understand that giving them a chance is only fair. It's totally American, and it's something that we should do as soon as possible. Mr. President, at this point, I'm going to yield the floor and uh, suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Mr. President, I'd ask suspension of the quorum call. Without objection, the Senator from Michigan. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I rise to express deep concern on behalf of families, students all across Michigan uh, who are very, very upset at the vote earlier today where we did not get enough votes, the supermajority needed to be able to get beyond the filibuster that's going on on the floor by colleagues on the other side of the aisle and therefore we can't actually get to the vote on the bill that would lower or maintain the lower student interest rates, student loan interest rates for uh, students all across America and certainly in Michigan. We know what will happen July 1 if we can't get beyond this. Uh, we actually have a majority of members, 53 members. I'm very proud that all of our members on this side of the aisle voted, in fact, to support the effort to maintain the low student loan interest rate. Uh, we didn't have the supermajority because it takes bipartisan votes to be able to get there, to be able to overcome the filibuster on the other side of the aisle. But we have enough votes and we just want to vote. We have enough votes uh, to be able to pass this bill, the Stop the Student Loan Interest Rate Hike Act. We have enough votes and we just need the opportunity to be able to vote. And what does this mean for middle class families, for students in Michigan and all across the country? Well, we're at a time, first of all, when middle class families are struggling to make ends meet. And no more, no, no more so than in Michigan, where we have gone through the deepest recession uh, for the last decade of any place in the country. And we need to be making college more affordable for Michigan students, students across America, and their parents, not less affordable. We ought to be doing things that would actually add to what we've done to support lower interest rates, more access to student loans, not taking that away, which is what's happening right now on the floor of the Senate because of the filibuster that is going on. Higher education costs are already rising. Michigan students are gra graduating with mountains of student debt while high school graduates are being priced out of the opportunity to be able to go to college. In fact, the average Michigan student is graduating with over $25,000 in student debt. And that's a heck of a place to start when you come out of college and you're looking for a job and trying to get started in a professional life or uh, trying to continue prof your professional life and at the same time support your family. Uh, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And we should not be adding to that because we're talking about additional debt on top of that $25,000 average if, in fact, we can't pass this bill. And we have, right now, more than 300,000 Michigan students, those who have borrowed money because they believe in themselves, they believe in the future, they want to get the skills and the, the degrees that they need to be able to go into the workplace, to be successful for themselves and their families. 300,000 students who are going to see their Stafford student loan interest rates double if we don't pass this bill. Double if we don't pass this bill. We need a sense of urgency like every single family feels right now who finds themselves burdened by loans uh, and we understand, I mean, they make the decision and we've been supportive of that, making loans available and lowering the interest rate over the last several years so more people can go to college uh, and be able to get the skills they need and be able to be successful in the workplace. But we should be continuing to support that and doing even more to help them lower the cost, not allowing the student loan interest rate to double come July 1. Uh, I, folks in Michigan are scratching their heads right now. You know, let me share, in fact, uh, stories that I've received. I've received a lot of input, um, a lot of stories from people, uh, not only throughout today, but before today, but certainly folks who watched the vote this afternoon and are horrified at what this means personally to them. Uh, for their children or for their families and we've received a number of emails through our office and I, I'm very thankful to people who are sharing their stories and I'd like to share just a few of them on the floor of the Senate. 
Liz from Traverse City wrote, please, please don't let them raise the interest rates on student loans. I have two sons at MSU, my alma mater, and I'm a single mom. I work a full-time and two part-time jobs. Let me say it again. I work a full-time and two part-time jobs. And they work as well. And without the student loans, they wouldn't be able to go to college. Even with the full Michigan Educational Trust MET loan I have, or grant I've worked on all their lives. So she put money into a program, a Michigan program, to be able to save money and put money aside. But this is somebody who's working one job and two part-time jobs on top of her full-time job, and her sons are working. And they still have student loans to be able to piece it together to be able to go to college. And she said, please help. Our three-person family is working very hard to get through school. And I would suggest that they are. And Liz, thank you for caring about your sons and working as hard as you are working. Uh, we need to make sure that we don't add cost to Liz and her two sons in July on top of everything they're doing to be able to create an opportunity for those two sons to be able to go to college, to be able to have a better life and a, a, a future for themselves. We shouldn't be adding cost to them. Lars from Ann Arbor wrote, as a student at the University of Michigan, I find it hard to keep up with current events, but I try in earnest. And this is an issue that affects me more than most others at this time. I'm footing the bill for my college education, largely myself. As my mom and dad, a high school art teacher and a GM retiree, respectively, do what they can to help in the short term. I'd like to work on behalf of keeping, I'd like you to work on behalf of keeping the interest rates lower. So Lars going to University of Michigan, a great university, and he's footing most of his college bill himself. His mom a teacher, his dad a GM retiree doing what they can to help, but he has to have student loans. Why on earth would we be adding to his costs come July when he's working very, very hard with the support of his family to be able to create a great life with a great education from a, a great university. Cassandra from Grand Blank wrote, I'm not what they consider a typical student. I'm a single mom of two obtaining my bachelor's degree in social work. And as a student and as a mother, I'm attempting to lift myself and my family out of poverty by doing the right thing, getting a college education. While it's been tough, and there are days I wish I could give up. I am pursuing my dream. And I will be graduating with honors in one year. If the rate increase happens, I cannot afford paying back my student loans while raising two children. Please do not let the interest rate expire on July 1. Cassandra, congratulations for all that you are doing as a single mom of two. Uh, as you said, lifting your family out of poverty. Uh, we in Michigan are a tough bunch. We don't give up, but I know how hard it can be trying to hold it all together during these times. And I want to thank you for doing that. And you're absolutely right. It would really be outrageous to see the interest rate on your loans when you're graduating next year with honors. Congratulations for that. But to be able uh, to know that you're going to at least have the interest rate on your loans continue as they have been, I know, would be a relief and a help to you. Angelica from Ypsilanti wrote, My name is Angelica. I am a 40-year-old mother of three who has returned to school to finally get my degree. I have recently been accepted at Eastern Michigan University. Congratulations and am starting classes in June. Without affordable student loans, I would not be able to attend school. I want to make a positive difference. Getting my degree will give me and my family a better standard of living and get out of the terrible cycle of poverty. 
This bill is critical to making the dream of higher education a reality for Americans and ensuring our workforce is prepared to compete in the 21st century global economy. Angelica, again, congratulations. As a mom of three, 40 years old, making the decision to go back to school, getting accepted, creating a plan for how you're going to be able to uh, use student loans, be able to hold it all together financially as you're moving forward. It's really outrageous to think that there's a filibuster going on right now to stop us from voting on something that would help you. We have the votes. This is not about whether or not we have the votes to maintain the low interest rate. We have the votes. We're being blocked procedurally from getting to the vote. And that is something that is very, very hard for me to understand. Michael in Mount Pleasant wrote, I'm a student at Central Michigan University studying information technology. And I'm also putting myself through school by whatever means possible. The amount of student loan debt I have, I will have to pay after a four-year degree casts a looming shadow. We're always taught to look toward the future and to jump at any opportunity that presents itself as an opportunity to better oneself. We as students are now looking at a future filled with uncertainty. Please do whatever it takes to do what you know is right and save our future from an impending financial defeat. Save our future from an impending financial defeat. Well, Michael, again, working very hard, has a path, knows what he wants to do, puts a plan in place, like most students and most families, to figure out how we're going to be able to pay it, both now in terms of the cost and paying back the student loans. And if we can't get a vote on this bill, we're pulling the rug out from under Michael. <coughs> Jennifer in Michigan wrote, for me, it means I'll be very unlikely to finish grad school. We say the US, especially Michigan, needs to invest in technology, yet they want to do things like this that will result in an uneducated society. Jennifer, I'm with you. This makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. At a time when we know we have to out-educate, out-innovate, to be able to out-compete in a global economy, doing things that add costs for families, middle-class families, working families, to, to add costs for loans. I mean, you're bearing the brunt. You're getting a loan. You're, you're believing in yourself and your future. We ought to be doing everything we can to support that, not adding more costs. And that's unfortunately what will happen if we cannot get beyond this filibuster on the floor of the United States Senate to have a real vote, a final vote. We have the votes. We're just being blocked from getting to the vote by the procedures of the Senate. Catherine in Michigan wrote, when I heard the interest rate for student loans is going to double, my heart sank. How is this even possible? My daughter is 21 years old, a psychology major at Western Michigan University, another great university in Michigan. And I'm so proud of her, as any parent would be. With interest rates set to double, how can these students possibly even begin to think of paying these loans back? All this does is discourage kids from going to college at all. And once again, only the privileged will be allowed to succeed. Please, once again, we need your help. There has to be a light at the end of this dark tunnel for these kids and for our nation. There has to be a light at the end of this dark tunnel for these kids and for our nation. I couldn't agree more. You know, we, we've got to make sure the light they see is not an oncoming train. We've got to make sure the light they see is actually their way through the tunnel of debt that comes with college loans and out into a future that is brighter for themselves, for their families. I mean, that's the hope. That's the promise of college education. And we have a responsibility 
to make sure that we're doing everything possible to support the hopes and dreams, the hard work, the sacrifice that is going on in colleges after colleges, in home after home, where people are making tough decisions in order to be able to give their kids a brighter future. Now, I was proud to help author the legislation in 2007 that cut the interest rates to where they are now, 3.4%. And I was pleased to help lead the effort as well to reform the student loan program and expand college access. Those were good things to do. Not bad things, good things. People have benefited. 300,000 people in Michigan right now have benefited from that opportunity, the commitment we made to support young people, people going back to college, to have a brighter future through a college education. Now is not the time to turn that around. The stop the student loan interest rate hike is common sense legislation. Doesn't add a dime to the deficit, fully paid for, and it's something that needs to get done now so that there is certainty for families across Michigan and across the country. Education really is the road to opportunity in this great country. And Michigan is home to world-class universities and community colleges. They're conducting cutting-edge, high-tech research to help transform the economy. Our schools serve to open doors, create opportunities for thousands and thousands of graduates every year. I'm always honored when I have the opportunity to speak at a graduation, as I have done this year, and to see the pride uh, relief <laughs> on the faces of students who have worked so hard, their parents, their pride, uh, and, and the commitment that they make to their children. I know how that feels as a parent uh, sitting in the audience as your kids graduate and walk across that stage with their diploma. This is ingrained in us as Americans. It's a foundation of who we are to create an opportunity for people to go to school, K-12, and then to be able to have a chance to go on to college so they can have the best shot at success. That's what we've had as a foundation in terms of our values as a country. This is not the time to turn it back. We need to be making it easier, not harder, for students to achieve a college education, which greatly improves their chances of getting a good paying job, being successful in life. We're at a moment now where we had a vote today where it was very clear we have enough votes to pass this bill to make sure that student loan rates don't double. We have enough votes to pass it. We just don't have support from across the aisle. We don't have the bipartisan votes that we need to get to a supermajority to stop a filibuster. That's what's going on right now. We need to vote. Folks don't have to agree with it. They can vote no on the final bill. Just let us vote. On behalf of the people we represent, let us vote on the bill. On behalf of 300,000 students and their families in Michigan, on behalf of hundreds of thousands of more who are looking for the opportunity to be able to go to college, to be able to work hard, take all the risks that come with that, and to be able to have a better life. I ask that we simply allow a vote. Let us vote on this bill. It's time to get on and let people know that we get it. We understand what families are going through. We understand the squeeze that middle class families are going through on every front right now. And make sure that access to college a higher education is not just there for the wealthy and connected, but that it's available to everybody because we're a stronger country because of that. Thank you, Mr. President. And I would suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
President, I would so, suggest the, the, I would ask that we suspend the quorum call. Without objection. The Senator from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to a period of morning business with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each. Without objection. I now ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the consideration of calendar number 358, S743. The clerk will report. Calendar number 358, S743, a bill to amend Chapter 23 of Title V, United States Code, and so forth, and for other purposes. Is there objection to proceeding to the measure? Without objection. Thank you. I ask unanimous consent that the committee reported amendments be agreed to, the bill as amended be read a third time and passed, the motion to reconsider be laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate, and any related statements be printed in the record as if read. Without objection. I would now ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the consideration of calendar number 390, H.R. 2668. The clerk will report. Calendar number 390, H.R. 2668, an act to designate the station of the United States Border Patrol located at 2136 South Naco Highway in Bisbee, Arizona as the Brian A. Terry Border Patrol Station. Is there objection to proceeding to the measure? Without objection. Thank you. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be read a third time and pass the motion to reconsider be laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate and any related statements be printed in the record as if read. Without objection. I would now ask unanimous consent the Senate proceed to S Resolution 447 submitted earlier today. Clerk will report. Senate Resolution 447 congratulating the students, parents, teachers and administrators of charter schools across the United States and so forth. Is there objection to proceeding to the measure without objection? I further ask unanimous consent the resolution be agreed to, the preamble be agreed to, the motion to reconsider be laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate, and any statements be placed in the record as if read. Without objection. Thank you. I would now ask unanimous consent that when the Senate completes its business today, the Senate adjourn until Wednesday, May 9th at 9.30 a.m., that following the prayer and pledge, the journal of proceedings be approved to date, the morning hour be deemed expired, and the time for the two leaders be reserved for their use later in the day, and that the majority leader be recognized. Without objection. I would ask for a quorum call. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.